Okay, this video is what is a Hollingworth gap? So Hollingworth gap is a communication range of about 30 IQ points for that domain, meaning that particular subject. And when you talk about academic IQ, you're really talking about, it's a measure of knowledge or achievement, academic achievement within that domain. So what I'm saying is if the topic is biology, then it's the domain of biology. If it's uh, history, then it's history. So a person can be really knowledgeable in one domain, like they know a lot of history, but they might not know hardly any biology or nutrition or something, for example. Or like a doctor, for example. They might have a very high academic IQ on the topic of pharmacology, but a very low academic IQ on the topic of nutrition. Okay, and the reason why I'm going through this is because it affects what a person can learn and what they can understand. Um, the claim of Hollingsworth, she was a psychologist, Lita Hollingsworth, who worked with a uh, school for gifted high IQ children, and she said if the gap on a topic was more than 30 IQ points apart, it was hard to have sustained meaningful communication. The person with the lower IQ will think the one with the higher for that subject is kind of weird, autistic, being boring, strange. The higher IQ will think the other person is being dull on the subject, okay? Um, and this also is used to claim that you'll have an audience, that the audience average IQ, they'll only like a speaker who's within about 30 points of the audience for that topic. Um, they'll claim, for example, that a, a TV actor, news person, teacher, politician will only be liked by the audience if they're within about 30 uh, IQ points on that subject of the average member of the audience. And of course, it depends on the context. You know, a young person, when they're going out to seek knowledge, they, they want a teacher that might know far, far more than them on a given subject. Um, if you find yourself in a subject where you really don't have a good uh, grounding in it, a good thing to do is the Feynman technique. Just make a text file on your computer, or you can do it in a notebook, and just start writing down everything you learn about it. Start watching videos, reading blogs, read books on it, listen to audio podcasts. And you'll keep accumulating information in that topic, and then you'll start to have more and more refined categorize, categories as you categorize the information, and you'll learn it well enough that the next time you hear a really good lecture on it, you'll be in the ballpark. You'll be ready to understand the key points. Because you could watch the advanced lectures on something when you don't have the basics uh, figured out yet, then it'll just go over your head. You won't get it. Um, and uh, I, I tell you, I like doing the Feynman. I do that tons of times whenever I'm trying to learn a new subject. Um, in the United States, in my experience, lots of people are so completely ignorant about subjects that they can't learn. They can't learn anything. A patient can't get better. Um, for example, I'll see those situations. So, you know, if somebody tells me that I'm being weird about something when I talk, because I usually try to talk in a very clear way, it probably means they don't know the subject well enough at all to even really have a conversation with them, okay? Uh, for example, if you want to know something about relevant modern history, current events, I would say the most valuable thing you could study would be read about the Russian Bolshevik conflict in 1917, okay? Once you know a lot about that, and by the way, I know a lot about that kind of stuff from all my reading, and I have tons of eyewitness accounts that I, people I spoke to that lived under um, Soviet Russia and also who lived in Eastern Europe during those times. So I know tons of stories I've heard. So I'm pretty familiar with that because people sometimes tell me, oh, how could you say this or that? And I go, well, I say that because I know the subject, okay? Um, as far as nutrition, if somebody's really you know, clueless on nutrition, I would say a good place to start, read the historical people, you know, study a little bit about Kempner, about Pritikin, about McDougall, and then you'll start to get it. The reason why I like all of these guys here is because they're very systematic in their thinking. It's all logical. It all makes sense. They built it up from the basics, okay? And <clears throat> once you've got that grounding, then you're a lot stronger when you hear, because a lot of people tell me, oh, they can't make sense out of something. How do I how do I know I'm right or someone else is right when you talk about whether or not, you know, like uh, Peter Atia says, animal protein is good for old people. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> you know, those guys coming out of Stanford are so f uh, full of BS when it comes to nutrition. <laughs> I, 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 we're not going to get into that anymore right now, but what I'm trying to say is I have my friends tell me and viewers tell me that too much contradictory information they can't make sense out of nutrition and what i'm saying is if you read these old time guys they just wanted to understand what was the truth and they write in a very clear way there's no commercial bias 
and then it becomes pretty obvious what the truth is, and then you can add on to it the concepts that will come out of you know more modern lectures, you know one of my videos or something, so that'll help you. Um, whenever somebody in my family says I'm being odd or autistic, I just say I think we have a Hollingsworth problem. You know, it's a polite way of saying they don't get it. Um, here was a normal distribution curve that I drew, you know, joking about health as it relates to diet, for example. And what I'm saying is it's very difficult to go from um, ignorant meat eater, processed food eater, all the way to being low fat, low sodium, vegan in one fell swoop. You kind of usually are going to have to work your way up to lacto, ovo, pesco, and then go to uh, low fat, low sodium, whole food, vegan, organic only, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, here's just showing an IQ distribution. So the Hollingsworth gap would be 30 points, meaning, you know, like I say, between 115 from 85 to 100 to 115, that would be 30 IQ points. A Hollingsworth gap, according to her theory. So anyways, there's one other thing I want to show you in this talk about. And that is the concept of six blind men and an elephant. So a lot of you heard me talk about this before. And the point is, what I'm saying is, if you're starting out to learn a topic, go ahead, read about it in a bunch of different contexts. You know, different authors. Go to, go ahead if you want. Go listen to Paleo Keto, and you'll notice once you start to know the subject that what they say is superficially sounds reasonable at first. But then the more you learn about it, the more ridiculous you see what their point of view is. So you know, it can be helpful to learn the wrong information if you have an open mind that it's going to be. There's a good chance it's going to be corrected soon. So. Um, just like Aristotle said, the first step in an intelligent conversation is to remove emotions. And the six blind men, you know, one felt the tail, said it's a, it's a rope. Another one felt the side, said it's a wall. One felt the ear, said it's a rug. Another felt the leg, said it's a tree trunk. Anyways, when you approach it that way and you make your little Feynman uh, notes on the subject, you'll build towards having a real solid nodule built up from basic principles. And people won't be able to BS you or refute you hardly at all. So I just keep this in mind because you'll hear me use that phrase a lot, Hollingwood's gap. And uh, anyways, hope that's.